fundamentally, humans are social creatures. We're the ultra social creature. We need human interaction like we need water, like that rat, or like that squirrel needs sustenance from its, its nuts. We desire it so much that it guides our behavior, it drives our emotions. And it also is a huge boon to humans to have that interconnectedness to one another. It enables us to learn from each other's behaviors and then to pursue different paths. Paths that might lead us one direction. If we watch one person do something, we can learn from them, say, we, we don't want that outcome. We're gonna do something differently. Humans need social interactions like we need sunshine, recreation. It's a fundamental need for us. Without it, we get sick, we don't thrive. Now psychology, after the turn of the century, a lot of things happened in the world that really drove changes in psychology. One of those things was, well, World War I. The introduction of the destructive power and the malevolence that humans had and could, could impact each other with really changed people's perspectives on human nature. It wasn't until World War II where we saw the atrocities of things like the Holocaust or dropping bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we saw the full implementation of human malevolence in a war machine with technology. And we were clearly incapable of doing anything about that. We didn't have the efficacy to even control our most malevolent side, the side of us that wants to destroy. This is where we saw a huge shift in human psychology and that was going for fundamentally, how do we develop ourselves? Developmental psychology became sort of the important side. How do we raise children that aren't gonna do this again? That aren't gonna set off bombs, that aren't gonna enslave, that aren't going to destroy millions of people? How do we do that? And that was the next shift in psychology called humanism. Now we're going to be talking about some of the things that people who work in the field of psychology do. As you know, there's not just one thing that psychologists do. For example, I teach, so that's one thing that people who train in psychology can end up doing is teaching. Most people that end up in the teaching profession are people who are teaching in the K-12 through system in public schools, although there are parochial schools, private schools, charter schools, etc but also employ people who have studied in the field of psychology and go into education. Um, in the book, it shows a great um, graphic, and the graphic is um, sort of a pie chart that shows the differences in, in what areas of, of psychology people can study. If you look in the book, you'll find this on page three, and it shows areas of specialization. That's sort of like which area of psychology you might focus on. For example, I told you that I studied the brain and that brain and behaviors relationship. That's called neuropsychology. Uh, it's a field in the neurosciences, right? So neurosciences encompass more than just neuropsychology. They encompass things like even molecular biology, chemistry, neurochemistry, neuroendocrinology, um, neuroimmunology, um, lots of things in neurosciences. My particular field was neuropsychology, assessing, brain damage and uh, potential brain damage pathology on people's behavior. So we call it uh, cognitive neuro testing. So, and we assess them, we assess their cognitive skill set. That is their ability to use their brain to do things other than the general stuff like say walking. We assess cognitive skills. Those are the things like thinking, verbalization using language, like mentation, like calculation, uh, memory, problem solving. Those are all areas where neuropsychology focuses. We also, some of us specialize in neuro rehab on what to do about those co cognitive problems that people have as a result of neurological injury. How do we compensate for them or how do we sort of uh, move around them or develop compensatory skills that enable people to um, thrive in their particular neurological setting. That's only one area of psychology. A lot of people are interested in that because the brain is such a unique uh, thing in the universe. The brain is so cool. When we get into, I think it's in chapter three, we'll start talking about um, the brain and its structures, its functions, uh, and its pathologies. But that was just one area. Uh, other areas, and specifically most people when they 
begin to think about a, a career or studying psychology, they think about clinical psychology, right? A lot of people say, well, I want to help somebody. Um, and what they mean by that is not necessarily they want to help somebody build a fence or they want to help somebody do their taxes because those are all helping people too. But what they're saying is they want to be an individual with another individual or a group that is an aid to their human thriving, to their emotional well-being. And that's the area of clinical psychology. I already spoke about Freud and Jung. They really began this clinical psychology route that had to do with people who are experiencing mental difficulties or mental illness that are not necessarily associated with a neurological illness. Now, I told you that Freud was a neurologist, but his uh, one of his famous cases had to do with a woman who had a gloved hand. She had uh, no feeling in her hand whatsoever. And he looked at her neurologically and said, this can't possibly be, um, you basically have three big nerves coming in here that are feeding your hand and taking information away from your hand. So they make your hand move and then they also sense when, when, you, um, when you receive some sort of pressure or warmth or, or other um, things that your sensory neurons in your hand can feel. And what he as a neurologist knew was, she can't possibly have had a gloved injury where above here is, is, is numb or, or has lost sensation unless there's been a mass, massive radical uh, bisection of all those nerves so that there's no communication. And he thought, well, she's experiencing this. She really is. So what could have been the cause of it? And he investigated that it was something to do with an internal uh, conflict in her person, in herself. Uh, that's a word that we use, a big garbage can term that basically talks about your experience of the world in and of yourself. Yourself um, is a product of your mind, or is it? We'll get to that in a bit. Um, but he said her hand wasn't injured from a neurological sense, it was injured from a psychological sense, and that something on her psyche was damaged, and it was injured, and it needed to be repaired. And he even showed that through treatment, through his... Um, psychological treatment of, of her and finding out her issue, I'll tell that story later, uh, she got relief from it, right? He didn't need to go in and sort of sew back together or something. Uh, you can't sew back together nerves. Uh, we'll talk about that in chapter three. But he was able to help her. And that's what most people want to do is they want to take people who are suffering in a psychological sense and they want to help them. And that's a really wonderful trait. In fact, when you look at the area of specialization in this book, it'll show you that the chart has about almost 70% of people who are studying psychology really want to be in the helping profession where they're seeing somebody who's suffering mentally, suffering psychologically, and they want to treat them. Now, even within clinical psychology, um, you'll see that like for, for me, when I studied clinical psychology in graduate school, I was studying clinical neuropsychology. And that's a different thing than helping people who have psychological illnesses. That's people who have neurological illnesses um, again, identify the sort of deficits and then make compensatory strategies or help them learn to rehabilitate themselves, right? The brains are capable of, of healing in certain ways and we'll, we'll get there in a bit. But a lot of people want to study clinical psychology because of a deep-seated desire to help. Now, if you're one of those people, don't feel like you're exclusively gonna have to do therapy where you sit and talk to somebody about them feeling bad. Um, some of us aren't good at that. <laughs> you probably will figure out that I'm not somebody who would have been particularly adept at um, treating people psychologically. Um, other areas of specialization are things like industrial organizational, forensic, health, cognitive, social, personality, educational, school, developmental, uh, and biological psychology. All these different subfields have different expertise, different literature, different scientific investigation, different methodologies, uh, but all of them are really aimed at sort of how do we fundamentally study the psychological nature of human behavior with a scientific perspective. Uh, we've covered a little bit about science, but science again is the objective measure by which we use hypothesis testing to assess the causal effects of certain variables on human behavior and action. The definition of psychology in the book, which has the scientific study of behavior and mental processes, is a little bit broad and difficult. Um, I like to think of it exclusively as human behavior, because that whole idea of mental processes, we'll see in a second, is, is a little bit problematic from a scientific standpoint. That's not to say that there's not an important 
fields of study that cover humans and their psychological well-being from outside of science. Particularly, I think of uh, things like religion uh, as been a big boon for people and their psychological well-being. Although we can't study the claims of religion uh, in a scientific sense, it's not like we should repudiate it as it's not scientific so it can't be good. When something's not scientific, it could be good, but when it's not scientific, we can't utilize the tools of science in order to analyze whether it works or not. So uh, science is limited to the questions it can answer. It has to be something that's observable. It has to be something that we can see. We'll look at some of the things that psychologists mainly do. Those are the small group of people who major in psychology, and then from that small group, there's another smaller group inside that group that then work in the field of psychology uh, once they graduate. One of the things that people in psychology do is go into government. You know, uh, we have majors like political science, government, international relations, all that have to do with the policies and the procedures and the laws of how people govern one another, how we agree to be governed by one another, how we submit from the state of nature, as Locke would say, into sort of a, a social contract. Um, think of Rousseau's social contract of what are we going to give up in our freedoms in order to gain the benefits from social interactions, social relations, social affiliations. Um, and so there are many psychologists that go into government and study the effects of governing on how people behave. Uh, this is particularly interesting right now. I know for a fact that many people in um, the government who have psychological training are really worried about how do they get the messaging out to help people to do the sort of prophylactic things to keep them from spreading uh, viruses and infectious diseases currently. How are we going to uh, utilize what we know about human behavior in order to benefit the group of humans that we're governing? There's also uh, a lot of clinical psychologists that work in the medical field. Now, those could be people that work in, say, um, outpatient care or in hospitals, like I used to as a neuropsychologist. I'll tell you stories about that in future videos. Um, but those folks work in an outpatient setting, typically in a hospital or in uh, large nursing uh, care facilities, elder care facilities. Um, then there are also people who work in psychology and have training in psychology or psychologists that work in, say, social work. And that's, a, again, sort of a, a quasi uh, combination of both the governmental aspect of it, because social work it happens typically in uh, organizations that are funded by the government, um, and has something to do with health care. Uh, and, and those folks deal with folks that have mental illnesses in the community or are dealing with homelessness. And again, the combination of those two is oftentimes um, prevalent. Um, and then they have people who are psychologists that work in independent practice. It's about a quarter of all psychologists work as independent practice. That's like, let's say uh, you or I were suffering from mental illness or, or just feeling bad or, or we, you know, something terrible happened to us. And we felt the need to go and to talk to someone about it because that's a beneficial thing to do. Talk to somebody privately and somebody who has training that can help us um, weather the storm of life, you know, the slings and arrows of life, or uh, can help us grow potentially from some problems that we're experiencing uh, as individuals. There's also people like me who work in higher education. So uh, professors, researchers, people that have received training in psychology and also are now working to teach people how to do psychology. So there's a, a, about 5% of people uh, who do that that have training in psychology. Studying psychology is really fun for me because I get to expose a lot of you to the ideas um, both that substantiate some things, some previously held beliefs, and also violate some of the stuff that you think is true about humans. Um, some of the myths that the book talks about include things like um, blowing off steam or expressing anger is really good for you. Sure, blowing off steam might seem like it's going to sort of cathartically, like we talked about with Freud, get off your chest some of those uncomfortable things. And yet, when we study this in a setting, in a clinical setting, that's doing research where we say, okay, we're going to ascribe one group of people to blowing off steam and the other group, we're going to say, nope, you got to hold in the sort of anger or angst. What we find is that not everything lines up with common sense reality or the sort of things that our grandmothers told us. 
A couple of critiques of that might be that the methodology we use to assess that might not be good enough to find out what's true for humans. Or, watch this, humans are so complex. Humans are so varied, right? That's the beauty of diversity of humans is that some of us might need to blow off steam in order for us to behave socially in a way that's appropriate and in a way to improve our, our thriving. And some of us, when we do that, actually beget more and more anger feelings. So when we look at science, science can answer some questions for us, but it can't tell us what's gonna be good for everybody. There's not gonna be a system where we just say, everybody do this and everybody will get good outcomes. It's not, not gonna be how it goes. There are other common sense things or, or misconceptions, previously held conceptions that you might have that are untrue. When we research people in large data sets, we do correlational or we do um, research studying people's well-beings, we might have conceptions or, or maybe even fears for ourselves. Like when we get to retirement age, life's going to be boring, we're going to be isolated and nothing's going to be fun. Life will be over at that point. When we actually go out and survey and research about how people are doing in their elderly years, we find that for the most part, they're very, very engaged with life and that they feel satisfaction and that they look back with, with pride on their lives and they're happy to be where they are. I can say from anecdotal evidence, which is not good to use in research to apply to everybody, but just from my perspective, as I age, of course there are things that I find I can't do now that I could do when I was younger. You know, my strength or stamina are both limited now compared to when I was say 10 years younger, yet, I find myself to be happier and happier with each new moment of life. And that has to do with differences not in just age, but in personality and in circumstances. Uh, so don't think that one thing's going to be true for all. A lot of times uh, we look at developmental issues and in the book it talks about this myth that punishment is a great way to change behavior over the long haul. Now, when we get into learning, we'll see that punishment is an effective strategy to change behavior. But the problem is that changing behavior over the long haul does not get the best outcomes when we utilize punishment. In fact, using reinforcement is something we'll see is far superior. If you want to change behavior over the long haul, you need to reinforce that good behavior instead of punishing the bad behavior. That's not to say punishment is something that shouldn't be a part of the toolbox that humans have in order to mitigate or change behavior. What it says is if you need to change something in the immediate, from a bad behavior to a not bad behavior, punishment might be an effective means. But if you wanna develop independence in that person to behave well in the future, you need to find a system and, and, and put some parameters around them that reinforce them for good behavior. Uh, this makes perfect sense uh, if you consider any of the strategies that we're looking at in changing our world. You hear a lot of advice from people about psychology. And what we'll do is we'll dispel some of that advice and then also shed some light on how humans function. The book uses the example of the myth of playing classical music for babies makes them smarter. You, you might even have seen some classic uh, music in um, educational videos like Baby Mozart, Baby Bach. Uh, while I love those videos and I definitely watch them with my kids, I didn't expect that those videos were going to somehow increase the IQs of my children or make them better at learning in the future. In fact, what we see is that it's not the actual exposure to the classical music, but it has to do with the fact that parents are involved in their children's learning is a far greater predictor of success and intelligence in children rather than something like exposing them to classical music. Now, classical music is great, classical music is good. I hope you like classical music and utilize it for your own purposes, but it's not something that's going to be uh, a ubiquitous panacea for all the ills of learning and childhood development. It's not going to fix everything. Uh, it specifically doesn't have an effect on changing how smart a, ch a child turns out to be. Um, so that's something that we hear. Um, you may have even heard, and we'll talk about this when we do development and pregnancy, that you know some mothers will put earphones on ar around their abdomen so that it's somehow projecting into the uterus. It, it, it's not really doing it that way. Uh, babies don't hear that well in utero. Um, there's a lot of noise inside the body. Uh, but that doesn't do anything for the child. It doesn't make the child better or worse. If we say projected nothing or something to the baby via those earphones, we don't see a statistically significant difference in the outcomes for children. Does that mean that mothers shouldn't do that when they're pregnant? You know, I have a neighbor over here, she's pregnant. Should she not play music to her child because science hasn't found that it is um, 
an effective strategy for increasing uh, brain development? Well, no, here's why. The fact that if she did that, she would be considering the outcomes for her child means that she's part of a group that is more caring, more intuitive, more um, forward thinking about the outcomes that she has now, the behaviors that she has now, and how it's gonna affect her child in the future. So again, it's not necessarily the playing of the music, but the playing of the music might be indicative of something else that is good for the child, and that's to have a mother, a parent, a family who's very concerned about their well-being. People who have dis people have distinctive learning styles. That's the, the classic one that people talk about. Oh, oh I'm, a, I'm a visual learner, or I'm an auditory learner. No, you're not. You actually have a fundamental ability to learn. Um, we'll get to that when we talk about intelligence, and Spearman called it G. There, there are many reasons why you don't have a particular learning style or you're not a kinesthetic learner or you're not a hands-on you know, learner. You have comforts, you have personality styles, personality characteristics we can measure, but there isn't something about you that's distinctively only good at learning one way. Um, you might have proclivities or desires, needs, wants, but there's not a particular thing. It's not like you could not learn through hearing if you said you're a visual learner. You could not learn through seeing if you said you were an auditory learner. It has to do with how we spend our time, how we uh, develop ourselves as people, um, not that there's some sort of inborn structure that then says this person is only a kinesthetic learner and they can't learn auditorily. You may have a desire to learn one way or the other, but when we study this in a clinical setting, we don't find that there are distinctive learning styles. Howard Gardner is the guy who came up with that, and there are reasons that Howard Gardner came up with some, came up with the idea of multiple intelligences, and we'll we'll talk about that when we cover intelligences. But what you should know is, you don't have a particular learning style. You have a learning ability, and how you spend your time developing that learning ability might make you think that you particularly are better at an auditory learner than you are a visual learner. Let's take the example of somebody who grows up out in the middle of nowhere with no Wi-Fi and all they have are books. They might say, well, I've become you know, a really important learner through reading alone. And uh, then let's say somebody else grew up in, you know, with Wi-Fi in their, in their house and internet, but they had no books. And they say, well, I'm really a visual auditory learner, right? I can't learn through books. You see that the setting is really what's uh, creating that type of learner in them. Both of those people had an innate learning ability, but then the context that they were in is what guided them towards what they feel like is their innate learning style. Next, I wanna talk about anecdotal evidence. What is anecdotal evidence? Well, you hear this all the time especially when these big contentious issues come up and you're looking on Twitter, somebody goes, I had a bad experience with a cop once, so therefore cops are bad. That's an example of anecdotal evidence. In psychology, in science, we can't use anecdotal evidence. It doesn't mean that it's, that it's not important for people to have experienced an individual thing. In fact, you'll hear a lot about people's lived experiences. However, those lived experiences are exclusively valuable to that person in their context for learning. They're not going to be something that's ubiquitously applicable to everyone. When we want to make decisions or we want to make large governmental choices or changes, what we need to do is use evidence that is applicable to everyone. And anecdotal evidence doesn't work. Anecdotal evidence is important to listen to about people's experiences, can give us ideas of what people are experiencing, but it doesn't necessarily tell us what would be true for other groups of people other than that particular individual. In science, we have to use reproducible um, studies to make uh, decisions about what we say is true or not for humans. A reproducible study is something that, if I say, you know, made people eat toast every morning, and I tested their learning, and I said, whoa, the group that got toast, they really excelled in whatever program of study they were in. But the group that didn't eat toast every morning they failed to succeed as well as the group that ate toast. That would be an objective study of toast's benefit on learning. Now again, toast, there's no studies that show that toast is somehow really beneficial for your learning, but that's an example of how I would utilize science and methodology, statistics, to say something about toast for everybody, rather than me saying, look, I'm, I got my PhD in neuropsychology and I eat toast every morning. You should too. You hear this a lot in advertising. 
Because while humans learn from each other's experiences, life's too short to learn from your experiences alone. That's why we have wise people. That's why we have leaders. That's why we have mentors, people that we trust. But oftentimes people use anecdotes. Do what I did and you'll get the same outcome. Uh, and, and we take that to heart. But the problem with that is it's not going to be applicable to everybody. It would be applicable to me. If I did the same things that I did, if I went back in my life and did the same things I did, guess what? I, I'm going to get the same results. But that's not something that's going to apply to the future. That's not something that's going to apply to more people than just me. And so we want to avoid anecdotal evidence when we're trying to make scientific investigations into human behavior and see what factors, what variables affect humans' behaviors in different ways. We're going to criticize a lot of research in psychology in here. And that doesn't mean that all research in psychology is bad. What it means is you need to be health. You have to have a healthy level of skepticism when we try to make um, research or anecdotal things applicable to everybody. We can't make big unilateral statements. People and behaviors are far too complex for that. So we, we want to be careful about that. And we want to know what the statistics and the studies are showing us and what we can expect in the future. The great thing about statistics is that if we use a good methodology and we use a good uh, data gathering method that's doing what we call utilizing some elements of what's called the central limit theorem, that's the idea if we take a sample of a larger group that that sample is going to give us a perspective that's accurate or at least semi-accurate about that larger group of people that we can make really good recommendations. In fact, we'll see that um, psychology has made wonderful improvements to human thriving by increasing our understanding of what variables that we shift are going to result in what outcomes later um, in human behavior. Um, we're not going to touch too much on philosophy, but we are going to consider philosophical contributions towards humans being able to develop a sense of science um, to be able to answer the questions. Previous, before science came around, before the Industrial Revolution, people often looked to philosophy and to religion to answer life's basic questions of where do we come from, what do we do. Now, science uh, is definitely supplanted philosophy and religion uh, with answering the questions about life for people, but it hasn't fixed the big questions. And in fact, the big questions are where people got started. It turns out we haven't, over thousands of years, haven't figured out those big questions. Where do we come from and what is life for? Um, those might be byproducts of our brain's development or evolution as we'll consider in the next coming parts of these lectures. But in reality, science has proven ineffectual at answering those questions. Uh, what it did do is took some of those big questions and then be able to answer littler questions that were very important as well. Um, and it starts out by, in the Western world, it starts out with uh, the great philosophers of ancient Greece. So you might know them. The great philosophers were Plato, Aristotle, um, and Socrates. Now, we don't know much about Socrates other than what Plato wrote. And some folks might even think that Socrates was a, a narrative trick or a, a character developed by Plato to provide somewhat of a background or somewhat of a conversation partner for Plato to discover what his thoughts really were. But here's the idea. So Socrates came first and he had some really important uh, thoughts that were shared about how we could use a method of questioning to drive down to our deep seated questions. Um, and then questioning really fundamentally what are the operationally defined terms that we're discussing here. You'll, you'll see this a lot in um, and people who have debates online is that they, they might be arguing semantics, right? That one person's using a definition here and that's not the same as the person over here. Uh, they might be using the same word, but they define those terms differently. And what Socrates did, um, or at least Plato told us Socrates did, was that he really began to help people learn to question and learn to be skeptical and learn to um, be very precise in how they defined what it was they were talking about. Um, Plato had an idea that um, we're imbued or, or we start off, our brain starts off, we're born with certain uh, granted or inherited characteristics. Now he didn't know anything about genetics, but he would say that people are born with certain positions. In Plato's Republic he famously talks about uh, Socrates saying that 
Um, we should lie to people and tell them that they're born with three types of souls, a gold soul, a silver soul, or a bronze soul. That those are unearned, not like our, say, Olympic athletes who will earn them through meritocracy, meritocracy, meritocratic, excuse my language, um, for performance, but that people were imbued and started out with that as uh, their starting point. Um, and that those souls that we were granted gave us different capabilities, different responsibilities to the community. If you haven't read Plato's Repub Republic, go read it. It's phenomenal. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful consideration as to what is justice. It really talks about justice. Um, if you are at all concerned with justice right now, and I think a lot of us are, it's a great place to go back and look where the Western world started to begin to say, well, what, what is fair? What is right? What is, what is just? And how can we govern ourselves, right? What's the true level of uh, governance over uh, each other that's, that's appropriate? So if you want to know about that, go read Plato's Republic. And he also started um, uh, uh, the academy, right? He started basically the way that we teach. The, I'm teaching you now. You're my student. He kind of set that up in his academy and we followed her ever since. One of his students was a man by the name of Aristotle. And Aristotle, um, like many of you will do, disagreed immensely with his teacher. And that's okay. It's okay to disagree with me. I want you to be skeptical of me. Just share how you are and let's make sure that that's not your feelings that you're saying, but something that's true for everybody that we can really look at and say, okay, this will be true for everybody, not just my experience or my interpretation of something. And Aristotle disagrees with Plato about the idea that people are born with innate knowledge. And Aristotle suggests that people only learn what they're exposed to through their senses. We've got these five senses and we'll, we'll cover those um, after we get through biology, but we only have these five senses. That's all we can do to see the world. And so Aristotle said that knowledge comes specifically through those five senses. Uh, he also was somebody who practiced what he preached. If you read about Aristotle, the guy was an absolute philologist. He loved learning and he loved learning about learning and he would investigate by using his body. He would, you know, he was investigating sea life and he would go fishing um, and he would classify these different animals, these types of animals that he found and he, he made speculative assessments of them. But he wouldn't only go and talk to himself, he would then go and talk to fishermen and find out what the fishermen knew about the fish. Again, what a great way to do it. Instead of taking the anecdotal evidence just from himself, right? It's perfectly good to get hands-on and, and understand something by your own experience, but then also talking to people who have more experience, right? Aristotle wasn't a fisherman, so he went and talked to the fishermen about what it was like and what the sea creatures were like and how the world of the sea worked. He was investigating it through the senses. He was investigating it through other people's senses. And this is very important for us. Many years go by uh, after the Greek philosophers uh, and the next uh, philosopher we're going to talk about wasn't just a philosopher. And those philosophers weren't just philosophers, right? They were teachers, they were educators, they were great thinkers. The next man we come to is, I think he's my favorite. He might be my favorite, what I would call psychologist, because he was somebody who's intensely curious about human behavior. And he wanted to classify it. And he wanted to, he didn't have science at the time. They didn't they didn't have science when, when Descartes was around because he was he was born in the fifteen hundreds, if you can imagine that. And he was a French philosopher, and he was uh, what some po folks might call a polymath. He was just this absolute paragon of knowledge and learning in all different facets. So let me tell you a little bit about Rene Descartes. Um, you probably have heard of him before. Um, whether it be through his famous contribution in philosophy, um, which would be cogito ergo sum. And that's the Latin for I think, therefore I am. We'll talk a bit more about that in a second, but that's probably where you've heard. You've heard that, I think, therefore I am. You've heard some derivation of it. Humans use it all the time for communication um, or as like a premise. It's almost like a proof of thinking. But that's not his only contribution. In fact, he at the time was digging up dead bodies because they didn't have um, cadaver labs like we have at, at CRC where you could go and learn about anatomy by cutting on an actual human body. 
a dead human body that is, but he didn't have that. He had to go rob graves and study it, but he studied anatomy and he studied the brain. And this was really important. He came up with this concept that, and we'll touch on this more when we do the brain, but that our brain is in contact with our soul. And so Descartes was what is what's called a dualist. And the problem of minds is that we can't see your mind. We can't see where your mind is. I mean, I can take pictures of your brain. Um, we can use MRIs, fMRIs. I can have you doing something. I have electrodes attached to your brain. We can't see the brain. We can see the activity of the neurons, but we can't see what's going on in the mind. In fact, if I showed you my neural activity now, and you, you might have somebody else's neural activity, and it would be indistinguishable from one another, but we, I and that other person, might be having very different experiences. So. What you want to consider is Descartes was not just a, a philosopher, he was not just an anatomist, um, he was a theologian, right? That I think therefore I am. That was part of a proof that um, went towards his concept that you could prove God's existence because uh, in sort of what's called uh, the platonic unmoved mover, something had to start you thinking and it wasn't you. He used that as a proof for the existence of God. Again, this guy was just a thinker extraordinaire. But that's not all he did. He also was a mathematician. For any of you who have taken any math classes where you use the X and the Y axis, you know, the X axis is the one that goes horizontally and the Y axis is the one that goes vertically. That concept is called the Cartesian plane because Rene Descartes, Cartesian, invented it. We swim in these waters, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Men and women who have invented and discovered and found out things and thought things that are so helpful to us now. Uh, you guys might not like the Cartesian plane, you might not like math, but trust me, it's very useful and humans have benefited from it for the last, you know, 700 years. Um, 500 years, excuse my math. Descartes was a polymath. He was so good in all those areas. What we're going to talk about Descartes is really along the lines of something else, which was his philosophy about the mind and the body, called the mind-body problem. The mind-body problem says this, you have a body that's a corporeal nature, right? Your human flesh, including your brain. But then you have this thing called your mind. Now, I'm not sure if you think about it this way, but I feel like I'm more than the cells that make up my body. It's my sense, my individual sense and anecdotal sense. So again, I can't prove that, but it's the sense that I have is that I am more. Many humans also feel this way. In fact, whenever you ask somebody, what do you think the experience will be like of dying? Okay. They think, well, I, the self will still be, and yet the body will have ceased to be a biological entity, it will have died and now it will be decaying. They understand that, but they also have this idea that they're going to go on, that there's something else to us more so than, than this body. Or as Yoda once said, luminous beings we are, um, that we are full of light, that we are embodied with uh, some sort of joie de vivre, this joy of life, this spirit. Um, and Descartes really believed that. But he was a man of science, again, before science existed, but he wanted to sort of prove this. And so what he said is, well, if there's a body, I know there's a body and there's a mind, they have to connect because the idea is that the mind directs my actions. My, my hands aren't moving of their own accord now, I'm choosing to move them. And just like my Henry, that's the nine-year-old who asked me about how does the brain get thoughts? He was asking a similar question what Descartes was struggling with is, where does it exist? Now, Descartes' Judeo-Christian belief was that we had an immortal soul, right? And this is what he might just refer to as the mind. And that the mind had to connect to the body somewhere. If you think of like um, an RC car or, or a drone, right? The drone is off flying independently. The RC car is off racing independently, but the controller has a little joey stick, little movements where they can move that particular thing. And the, the connection has to go through uh, radio signals, right? Radio controlled is RC. So Descartes had this concept that your brain was really the receiver portion for the mind 
that then told the brain what to do and then your body enacted it. He's called a dualist. Dual meaning that there's a mind and a body. And that the, the, the connection was a little bit murky. He didn't really know where that was. He suggested it was your pineal gland, which we'll get to in a bit. It's interesting and wrong because if I take out your pineal, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna take out your pineal gland, don't worry. But if I did, some people who don't have a pineal gland, it's not like they don't have a soul or a mind, right? They, they still do. That being said, that leads us to scientific understanding of the brain, which sort of goes against Descartes and says, look, Descartes, this mind, this soul thing that you're talking about, we can't see it, we can't measure it, so we can't say anything about it. The monist view, monist being one, dualist being two, the monist view is that the brain is the mind, that its functioning is the mind, that the interaction of all the neurons is what causes this concept, this sensation I have that I'm more than my corporeal body is just a byproduct of neural activity. Now, I don't know what you think. Um, my guess is that you think that you're more than your body. People have fear of death. Um, and why they have fear of death is that they don't know the answer to this question, right? If we knew that we were more than this body and this was just a, a portion of our trip through existence, people wouldn't fear death as much. Now, what's very interesting, and we'll get into this, I think it's chapter four or the, anyway, when we talk about drugs, we'll see that death anxiety is actually massively reduced when people have spiritual and mystical experiences uh, induced through several different ways, um, specifically like entheogens or hallucinogens, you know, psychedelics, drugs. When they trip, it's been shown to reduce death anxiety, clinically, statistically significant reduction in death anxiety through mystical spiritual experiences. Super interesting caveat here. What area of the brain gets affected tremendously by those types of drugs? The pineal gland. Descartes was on to something. Something more than a rudimentary understanding of neuroanatomy. He had something, and he, maybe he was lucky, but man, the pineal gland is turns out to be very important in um, consciousness, uh, specifically secreting melatonin to make you sleepy, to transition from conscious to unconscious. We'll cover more of that in the future videos on the brain. But Descartes was really onto something, and this is a big issue that we have, which is the mind-body problem. Of We have this sense of a mind, and we have this body, and we don't understand necessarily the connection between the two. So the problem of the mind that Descartes has, people independently still get that. You know, my Henry that was asking those questions was just a child considering what he understood about the brain and the body and how it works and going, how's this all work out? While we praise Descartes for his ingenious contributions in science and math and theology and philosophy, uh, we haven't figured it out since, and yet we're still asking, asking those same questions. Now we're going to talk about some of the contributions made by early pioneers in psychology who I haven't already discussed, and those are the women. Now, if you know anything about history, women in society held different places and functioned in different roles than they currently do. Uh, you might think that that's good. If you're critical, you might think that it's good and bad. If you're somebody who's reasonable, you might understand we've made great gains in understanding how to incorporate women's abilities, differences, and capabilities into our modern world to make it a better place. That wasn't the world of early psychological pioneers. And so it was rare that women were making big contributions. That doesn't, however, remove them from the equation. The first woman that we're gonna talk about is the woman who started it all, and that's Mary Whitten Clark, and she was a Harvard student in psychology. She was actually a student of William James, the classic father of American psychology. Her work on personality was very important, but she was denied the ability to get a PhD. This didn't dissuade her from later becoming the first president of the American Psychological Association in, I believe, the 30s. Mary Wickings Cocken was the first female to earn the requirements for a PhD. However, she wasn't granted one. At the time, Harvard College wouldn't allow for women to study or matriculate there, and therefore, despite the fact that she did all the work, um, she was one of uh, the best students of William James at Harvard. She wasn't allowed to get her PhD. Uh, actually, the first woman that got the PhD was uh, Margaret Flo Washburn. So Margaret Floyd Washburn, 
got her PhD from Cornell, which is in New, uh, one of the Ivy League schools, but it's in New York. As they allowed for women to matriculate there, and so she was the first woman who received her PhD in the field of psychology. Psychology hasn't been as exclusive of a club for the entirety of its um, existence, but there definitely remained at the time cultural implications for women and cultural obstacles that were not there for men that they had to overcome if they wanted to pursue their degrees in psychology. One of the first women who became very um, prominent in the field of psychology was Mammy Phipps Clark. Now Mammy Phipps Clark was the first woman who was black and awarded a PhD in psychology and she was awarded that from Columbia University, another Ivy League school in New York. She was married to Kenneth Clark who together with uh, he was holding a professorial position at the City University of New York. I actually, that's where I came to Cosumnes River College from as I was teaching at Brooklyn College, which is part of the CUNY system, the City University of New York, CUNY. I never met them. I think they're both dead. Oh, um, there are some other famous people that I'll tell you about that actually were involved at Brooklyn College. But Mammy Clark uh, made very important contributions to our understanding of what causes children who are exposed to trauma, specifically about racial oppression, what that does to them developmentally over the long haul. She and her husband, Kenneth, reported to the Supreme Court um, in the landmark decision that was uh, Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka in 1954. In that decision, it was shown that segregation in schools was causing black students to receive inferior education. That it was not a ubiquitously equal playing field for black students in schools and that they were being told that being black was not as good. She also did some research um, showing children would choose, uh, even black children would choose to have white dolls rather than having black dolls. And this, uh, they talked about being reasons that internalized racism was affecting the youth of America, that um, their concept of beauty was that of the public, and that was of a white person rather than that of someone who looked like themselves. And then the idea is that they would not believe themselves to be beautiful. They would not have a good self-concept. That research that she and uh, Dr. Kenneth Clark did was very important in forming sort of social obligations to development of children and helping think about their self-esteem. We'll talk more about in the future how that went awry and why that went too far as things often do um, and what that led to in terms of the culture where everyone gets a trophy and no one actually knows if anyone's made a contribution. While women were oppressed early in psychological research, um, they are not today. In fact, 75% of um, graduate students in psychology and clinical psychology are female. And so we have rectified that, if you believe rectified is 75-25. Or you might think, oh no, 25% male, that means that males are being discriminated against. Again, things are not that simple. Don't have simple ideologies because simple ideologies are not good for a complex world. But that's the reality is that we have about 75-25 female to male split in psychology that might have to do with an, an intense need for women to use science to understand human emotion and behavior uh, and that men don't feel the same need in the same way in the same amount it's okay to have differences one of the early women who contributed greatly to the field of psychology was in fact dr freud's daughter anna freud anna freud was a collaborator with dr freud and made some very important contributions including uh, a helping to focus on female uh, psyche and to focus on child development and that's that's to note because even back in the late 1800s um, women were being able to make contributions to psychology while they were not able to vote in western cultures while they were uh, not able to hold positions or gain college degrees um, nothing stopped them from pursuing that and that's something important to recognize is that if you feel oppressed if you are legitimately oppressed like they were or even if you feel oppressed the answer to that is not to go, oh, woe is me, and go huddle in a back room somewhere and say, society won't let me contribute. Right? These women, right, uh, Margaret Flo Washburn, uh, Mary Whitkins Clark, uh, 
uh, Anna Freud, um, Mammy Clark, they all contributed greatly despite having massive opposition, despite society saying to them, you don't belong in academia. That's what we tell stories about. Those are the people we tell stories about. Those are the heroes. Because despite their obstacles, despite their oppression, they rose up and they made major contributions. And they changed the game. Because again, 75% of clinical psychology PhDs are now granted to women. So, there you have it. If you're willing to do the work, it's possible to rectify some of the wrongs of the past. But it doesn't come from complaining. It comes from striving harder than anyone else. Harder work. Again, that's going to be uh, throughout this course. It's going to be something that your individual choice to work hard is what can bring you to a new position rather than some sort of magical um, solution from policies or, or research or, or what scientists find out. It's up to you. You have efficacy. Next we'll be talking about different perspectives in the field of psychology. The first one that we'll talk about is the psychoanalytic because that's really the first one that started kickstarted it off. Now there were the experimentalists, those are the Titchners and the Wundts, um, who and the functionalists like William James, who initially uh, started psychology by doing really inquiry into sort of human physiology or human reactivity and how, how fast we could react to things. Yet that's not where we've sort of come today. The outgrowth really came from Freud's insights about how early childhood experiences, traumas, could affect later adult development, and specifically how underlying unconscious conflict might cause us to avoid things and develop some sort of mechanisms to that, that become maladaptive later. That's the psychoanalytic, and it has this idea that the underlying unconscious conflict is what causes you to have mental illness uh, in the current state, and that once you uncover that, once you um, lance the wound or um, go through a process of catharsis of letting out what it is that bothers you, you know, that solves it. What came up next was what was called the behavioralists. The behavioralists were people who suggested that behavior is only through learned uh, experiences, right? And if, if you think about this, what I just told you about Plato and Aristotle is the same sort of cycle of understanding of human behavior keeps coming up, which is one, we're imbued with something early on or, or innately, as Plato and Freud said, or then later, as B.F. Skinner or J.B. Watson said, oh no, it's all learned, right? Just like Aristotle. So you have this sort of juxtaposition of going back and forth between, again, nature, you're born with it, and nurture, you learn it. Um, this is not something that we've gotten over today, but we have grown into a new understanding, which is that both have clear importance. And we'll talk about epigenetics when we discuss those impacts. But biological psychology, I'm sorry, behavioral psychology, um, started with the early behaviorists of J.B. Watson and B.F. Skinner. Uh, you didn't have to have a two initial first name to be a behaviorist, but uh, they were. And they really believed that everything was about experiences and learning, uh, and that you were basically a tabula rasa, as John Locke, the ancient British empiricist, once said, that you were born as a blank slate. That was around the time of World War II. After World War II, people had a real sort of come to Jesus moment about human nature. And um, they realized that there were some nasty parts of human nature that needed to be discussed and, and, and uncovered and that helped and, and empathized with. And this sort of grew into what is called humanistic psychology. And the goal of humanistic psychology is basically to help people thrive, to help them grow. We've kind of turned back towards humanistic psychology recently. If you're given the right context, if you're given the right uh, relationships, that humans tend to grow in healthy ways. And that perspective was one that was shared by people like Abraham Maslow, um, people like Carl Rogers. The next iteration that came through, and that was again the 50s, 60s, is really cognitive psychology. Cognitive psychology was sort of this, wow, the brain can do all sorts of really cool stuff. Let's measure thinking abilities, memory abilities, because some people have amazing linguistic skills and you know savants who can play the piano concertos by hearing it once, and people have these amazing skills. Let's check what the brain's extents or limits are, and that sort of developed into cognitive psychology. Now, all along the time, in fact, Freud was influenced heavily by uh, the 1856 publication of On Origin of the Species, which is Darwin's great work. Evolutionary psychology began to start, and that 
idea is something that came to fruition right around the same time as the cognitive psychology revolution after humanism in the 50s and 60s was this idea that human behavior is a result of a process that naturally selected for it such that the fittest behaviors in human society were those that got passed down generation to generation, whether it be through gene or through meme. We'll discuss the distinction between those in a bit. But the idea that human behavior was selected for by the process of natural selection and evolution, evolutionary psychology is this idea that today our current behaviors, what I'm doing now is a result. The communications I'm having now, the, the infrastructure of education that we have now today is because in the past that greatly benefited <clears throat> people and they were able to survive and thrive and reproduce, right? That's sort of the, the, the tripartite um, monster of evolutionary theories, survive, thrive, and reproduce. Something about our behavior that we're doing now, all the aspects of that in evolutionary psychology's perspective is it has benefit for those th things to survive, to thrive, and to reproduce. The next thing we'll talk about is biological psychology. In the 90s, this is back when I, I was in high school in the early 90s, the big new innovations were happening with neuroimaging. Now, neuroimaging is the way we look at the brain. We'll discuss this in chapter three. But the revolution of being able to look into the brain while the person is alive and to look into healthy brains and to see what it's doing really changed the game for psychologists because then we were able to sort of say, what are the neural correlates to human behavior? And the 90s was, was named the decade of the brain. That's biological psychology. What does our biology have to do with it? Now, biological psychology, like all the rest of them, have gone through multiple iterations, and right? So once they go through their course, they kind of morph and they change and then they integrate. And currently, we really think of psychoneuroimmunology. Um, psychoneuroendocrinology is this big field. Psychoneuroendocrinology is this interface between both our endocrine system, the glands that produce hormones and affect our body in, in massive ways, great areas of tissue, and the brain, which is our neurons, our neural network, uh, which influences our body to move and to, to do certain things in, in where we have our efficacy, our choices to make behaviors, and sort of the influence of those. And then psychologically, it is this sort of perspective of ourself, our learning, our personalities, our proclivities, our limits, our abilities, our merit-based learning that we've done. What that allows us to do is psychoneuroendocrinology. I skipped over one, but it's one that I really feel like is probably one of the most important ones, and that is this idea of social psychology. I skipped over it because it feels more relevant today than ever. It wasn't something that I particularly studied other than through my general psychology courses, but as I began to teach psychology and I began to investigate the studies that were done in social psychology, what I found is, is that the most profound impacts on changing behavior have to do with social psychological implications rather than, say, biological ones. Now, biological ones are very important. Don't get me wrong. Most complex thing other than the universe is your brain. Um, and so I really do think it's an important area to study. But when we want to understand why people are doing what they're doing and why they're doing things so differently from one another, rather than looking at differences in biology, which are not really there across humans. Humans are the same species. We're the same species. So we all have the same underlying biology. What is different is our social context. And when we see the differences in social context, we see that there's a great variation in humans, places that they exist, systems that they exist, relationships that they have for groups of people, and specifically the roles that they feel like they have within that particular context. Social psychology is a perspective that I think you're going to find extremely useful in understanding things that are happening today, in the experiences that you're having today, in the things that the world is confronting today. Social psychology is going to give you those answers.